Recording in progress. Welcome to Child Health Safety and Nutrition, Assignment 1. This course is a particularly important course in your understanding of child health safety and nutrition. The information that you will learn in this course will help you support children in a daycare, preschool, home care setting, and in a classroom. The textbook for this course can be bought as an e-textbook. We always encourage students to purchase e-textbooks because they're much more affordable and are sent to your email quickly. Uh, the information in this PowerPoint will help you deeply understand your role and provide you with the necessary information to make you more effective when you work with kids. So let's get started. As we all know, growing a mentally healthy generation starts from the early years. What an infant experiences from the start of life can impact their mental health and well-being into the future. Is your wellness important as well? Absolutely it is. Does the wellness of children matter? Of course it does. Wellness refers to complete health rather than just your physical health. Wellness is not only being free of disease, illness, or stress, but also having a purpose in life, being emotionally healthy, taking an active involvement in work and in, in leisure time, having joyful relationships and being above all happy. Wellness involves all aspects of your life beyond your physical health. To enjoy fulfilled and happy lives, it is important to take care of your well-being and to invest time in your wellness. Wellness matters. So years of research in child development have identified eight essential requirements for kids to become happy, successful adults, what we all want. Let's go on to the next slide. So what does wellness look like for children? So if you look at the slide, uh, you can see exercise and brushing teeth and getting plenty of sleep and having good hygiene, washing your hands, eating healthy meals, getting your flu shots and proper immunizations, uh, drinking lots of water and looking after yourself uh, means wellness for young children. So the eight things that kids need to, to thrive is one, security. Kids must feel safe and sound with their basic survival needs met, such as basic needs like shelter, food, clothing, medical care, and protection from harm. Stability. Stability comes from family and community. Ideally, a family remains together in a stable household. But when that's not possible, it's important to disrupt the child's life as little as possible. Kids and families should be a part of larger units to give them a sense of belonging, tradition, and cultural continuity, consistency. So there should really be no good cop, bad cop. Parents and caregivers and teachers should synchronize their parenting and make sure important values stay consistent. Emotional support. Parents and teachers, words and actions should encourage kids' trust, respect, self-esteem, and ultimately, independence, care. Saying and showing you care about kids can overcome almost any mistakes you might make. Let's face it, we're all human, mistakes happen. Even when kids have disobeyed or angered you or frustrated at you and rebelled against you, which will happen, uh, show them you care about them and always, always care about them. Education, make sure children get the best possible education for their future. Give children invaluable life lessons during the time you spend together. Positive role models. This is probably the most important thing. Uh, parents and teachers, parents are their most first and foremost important role models, but teachers can just be as instrumental in impacting a child's growth and understanding. We need to instill our values and teach children empathy by being the kind of person you want them to become. And structure. Rules, boundaries, and limits. Without them, children are forced uh, to be adults before they are ready, and they lose respect for you and other adults. So, wellness. If you look at this slide, like I had mentioned earlier, this the slide lists the basics of wellness. What else is needed to be well socially, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, physically? 
What is safety and nutrition important? Why is it important to us? So let's go on to the next slide. So Bronfenbrenner's ecological system theory. So if teachers know and appropriately use just one theory that is relevant to education, it's this theory. Ron Friend Brenner's, okay, it's a mouthful, uh, theory is the theory to go to. What is safety and nutrition and why is it important to our wellness? This theory explains this. Ron Friend Brenner's is the theory that lets teachers know about how children interact with peers, friends, teachers, and other adults, and how it impacts a child's growth as um, in their typical day. Of course, how these activities occur depends in part on the personal characteristics of all individuals involved, the children, their parents, their friends, and their teachers. Those activities also are, are heavily influenced by the context in which they occur, whether at home, in the child care center, the park, the grandparents' home, or with a child minder or some other type of informal care. The way in which children's classroom is organized clearly has an impact on the way in which children can engage in activities and interactions. And what happens in one context also influences what goes on in other contexts. Children who arrive at school hungry will engage with their teachers and peers quite differently than those who are well-fed, we know this. Children who come from homes in which parents have time, interest, and energy to invest in them will arrive in, to school much better prepared than those who do not. So let's take a closer look at this ecological system theory. So the microsystem, this is the layer closest to the child and contains a structure with which the child has direct contact. The microsystem encompasses the relationship and interactions a child has with her immediate surroundings. Structures in the microsystem include family, school, neighborhood, or child care environment. At this level, relationships have impact in two directions, both away from the child and towards the child. For example, a child parent may affect his beliefs and behavior. However, the child also affects the behavior and beliefs of the parent. Ron Friend-Berners calls these bi-directional influences, and he shows how they occur among all levels of the environment. The interaction of structures within a layer and interactions of structures between layers is key to this theory. At the microsystem level, bi-directional influences are strongest and have the greatest impact on the child. However, interactions at outer levels can still impact the inner structures. The microsystem, is the small immediate environment the child lives in. Immediate relationships such, such as family, caregiver, school or daycare. How these interact with the child will have an effect on how the child develops. The more encouraging and nurturing these relationships are, the better the child will be able to grow. How a child acts or reacts to these people, including teachers, um, in the microsystem will affect how they are treated in return. The mesosystem, this layer provides a connection between the structures of the child's microsystem. Examples, the connection between the child's teacher and his parents within his church, uh, Gordwara and the neighborhood. The mesosystem describes how the different parts of a child's microsystem work together for the sake of the child. For example, a parent taking an active role in the early years setting. In contrast, if the child has two sets of caregivers, and they disagree on how to best raise a child, this will hinder the child's growth. The exosystem, this layer defines the larger social system in which the child does not function directly. The structure in this layer impacts a child development by interacting with some structures in her microsystem. Parent workplace schedules or community-based family resources are examples. The child may not be directly involved at this level, but, but the child does feel the positive or negative forces involved with the interactions within his or her own system. The exosystem level includes the other people and places that the child may not interact with often, but will still have a large effect on their development, such as a parent's workplaces, extended family members, and the neighborhood. For example, if a parent loses their job, it may have a negative impact on the child's nutrition. 
macro system. So this layer may be considered the outermost layer in the child's environment. While not being a specific framework, this layer is comprised of cultural values, customs, and laws. The effects of larger principles defined by the macro system have a cascading influence throughout the interaction of all other layers. For example, if it is the belief of the culture that parents should be solely responsible for raising their children, that culture is less likely to provide resources to help parents. This in turn affects the structures in which the parent functions. The parent's ability or inability to carry out that responsibility towards their children within the context of the child's microsystem is likewise affected. The macro system is the largest and remotest set of people and things to a child, which still has an influence over the child. The macro system includes such things as the relative freedoms permitted by the government, cultural values, the economy, and our wars. These things can affect a child either positively or negatively. The chrono system, this system encompasses the dimension of time as it relates to a child's environment. Elements within a system can be either external, such as the timing of a parent's death, or internal, such as the physiological changes that occur with the aging of a child. As children get older, they may react differently to environmental change and may be more able to determine how more how that change will influence them. Nature versus nurture, more modern child development theories accept that both the child's biology and their environment play a role in change and growth. Theories now focus on the role played by each and the extent to which they interact in ongoing ways. The chrono system includes the patterns and changes of environmental events and transitions over time. For example, it has been found that following a parent's divorce, the negative impact on a child is more prevalent in the the first year following the event, and after two years, family relationships and interactions are more stable. It also includes changing socio-historical circumstances. For example, the increase of women working full-time compared to 30 years ago. As with all theories, there are limitations to this theory. A limitation of the ecological systems theory is that there is limited research examining the meso system mainly the interaction between neighborhoods and the family and the child. Therefore, it is unclear the extent to which systems can shape child development. Another limitation with Bronfenbrenner's theory is that it is difficult to empirically test the theory. The studies investigating the ecological system may establish an effect, but they cannot establish whether the systems are the direct cause of such effects. Furthermore, this theory can lead to assumption that those who do not have strong and positive ecological systems lack in development. While this may be true in some cases, many people can still develop into well-rounded individuals without positive influences from the ecological systems. For instance, it is not true to say that all people who grow up in poverty-stricken areas of the world will develop negatively. Similarly, if a child's teacher and parents do not get along, some children may not experience any kind of negative effect from this um, if it does not con concern them. As a result, people need to take care not to make broad assumptions about individuals using this theory. The world has changed a lot since Bronfenbrenner's theory uh, was introduced in terms of technological developments as well. However, it could still be said that the exosystem of a child could be expanded to include social media, video gaming, and other modern day interactions. This could suggest that the ecological system systems are still valid, but will expand over time to include new modern developments. In summary, Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory is one of the most accepted explanations regarding the influence of social environment on human development. This theory argues that the environment you grow up in affects every facet of your life. The bioecological model is based on the idea that the relationships children have with parents and caregivers impacts their development and that these relationships are affected by their work, school and community settings, which are in turn affected by broader social, cultural and policy conditions. So let's look at the next slide. 
Um, and let's continue to look at this theory and its implications for practice. So let's look again at this theory one more time. So Bronfenbrenner sees the instability and unpredictability of family life we've let our economy create as the most destructive force to a child's development. Children do not have the constant mutual interaction with important adults that is necessary for development. So according to the ecological theory, if the relationships in the immediate microsystem break down, so looking at the microsystem, if they break down, the child will not have the tools to explore other parts of his environment, his or her environment. Children looking for the affirmations that should be present in the child-parent uh, relationship look for attention in, in inappropriate places. These deficiencies show themselves, especially in adolescence, as antisocial behavior, lack of self-discipline, and inability uh, to provide self-direction. This theory has dire implications for the practice of teaching. Knowing about the breakdown occurring within children's homes, is it possible for teachers and the educational system to make up for these deficiencies? It seems now that it is necessary for schools and teachers to provide stable, long-term relationships. Yet, Bron von Berners believes that the primary relationship still needs to be with someone who can provide a sense of caring that is meant to last a lifetime. This relationship must be fostered by a person or people within the immediate sphere of the child's influence. Schools and teachers fulfill an important secondary role, but cannot provide the complexity of interactions that can be provided for a primary adult. So to strengthen the development between the ecological system in educational practice, according to the theory, teachers and parents should keep good communication with each other and work together to benefit the child. Teachers should also be understanding of the situation their students' families may be experiencing, including social and economic factors that are part of the various systems. So according to this theory, if parents and teachers have a good relationship, this should shape the child's development in a very positive way. Like that, likewise, the child must also be active in their learning, engaged both academically and socially. They must work as a team with their peers and get involved in meaningful learning experiences to enable positive development. So let's look at the next slide. So uh, learning is an ongoing process that is simultaneously biological and cultural. Each individual learner functions within a complex developmental, cognitive, physical, social, and cultural system. Learning also changes the brain throughout the lifespan. There are a multitude of factors that are involved in learning, including physical development, cognitive development, language development, and social emotional development, as well factors such as having a positive approach to learning, teaching with a purpose, and developmentally appropriate practices are important. At the same time, the brain develops in ways that impact learning are in turn shaped by the learner's context and cultural influences. Research goes on to say that factors that are relevant to learning include influences from the learner's neighborhood, community, and the time period in which they live. Even at the most basic level, evidence shows that brain development and cognition are guided and organized by cultural, social, emotional, and physiological experiences that contribute to both age-related and individual variability in mm -hmm. learning. So educators must employ a variety of approaches to support the whole, whole child. Let's take a closer look at this slide. So on this slide, you see a lot of cute, cute kids mm -hmm. uh, hearing a book or playing. Um, so we know that children, ex ch a child experience mm -hmm. Uh, experiences learning through play. So children's experiences mm -hmm. are actively engaging, should be joyful, should be meaningful, and mm -hmm. children should have the ability to socially interact with each other. Literature. So impacts mm -hmm. studies of primary school pedagogies that foster a range of skills and the value mm -hmm. and value of the characteristics of play. Learning outcomes associated with learning through play. We need to educate the whole child. 
whether uh, in all domains, including social, emotional, physical, cognitive, and creative. So let's take a look at the last slide. So in a play-based or child-centered program, children are able to choose activity based on their current interests. Learning activities such as creative arts, literacy and numeracy, social studies, science, etc., are presented to children through play. So educators encourage children to play, facilitate both social and emotional skills along the way. It often looks like children are just playing, but in fact, they are learning important educational, social, emotional, and life skills through the process of play. Play enhances children's physical, social, emotional, and creative growth and development. It is the primary means by which children explore their world and begin to make sense of the world around them. Without play, it is difficult uh, for a child to understand how the world functions and how they can function in it. It is evident that play has a major role in the cognitive development of the child. Through play, children actively pose problems, explore solutions, and begin to develop a real understanding of how things function in the world around them. Educators can support this play-based philosophy by offering and encouraging the engagement in play-based activities centered around academic areas that will allow for cognitive development, as well as activities that will promote social and emotional learning. So let's take a closer look at this slide. So child development through play. So physical development. How do children uh, gain uh, physical development? So their strength-based agility, coordination of large muscles, fine motor coordination. So all these areas are developed. In terms of cognitive development, literacy and math skills improve, comprehension skills improve, logical thinking improves, and language acquisition improves. Also, uh, sharing, collaboration, cooperation, uh, their social development in the areas of conflict resolution, understanding of other cultural backgrounds, positive self and concepts improve. Also, their emotional development improves. So they have empathy, understand others' feelings, have more self-control. They bond with peers and st they have stress management. So what is developmentally appropriate uh, curriculum? The term developmentally appropriate uh, sorry, developmentally appropriate refers to the practice of making a curriculum based on what students are able to do cognitively, physically, and emotionally at a certain age. Of course, not all children develop at the same rate, so often there's a range of abilities that are considered developmentally appropriate for each age. Preschoolers teach the basics to kids, giving them a strong foundation for the elementary years. This includes academic concepts of literacy and math, such as counting, coloring, and letter recognition, and developing large and fine motor skills, such as walking in line and using a pencil. It also includes social and school readiness skills, such as making friends, sharing, and taking turns. While it may look like a child is simply playing in the classroom all day, that's not the case. We know this. Play is so much more than a child having fun though kids are certainly having lots of that, especially when it involves interacting with other children. Play teaches children how to form relationships, friendships, learns how to learn how to cooperate, take turns, think creatively, try out different ways of problem solving, and use their ima imagination. Uh, I just wanna read this little quote to you. Play is an essential part of early learning. It is the lifeblood of the learning process. As children play, they are developing the cognitive, socio-emotional, and physical skills they will need to take them into a successful adulthood. They are developing their curiosity, problem solving, intentionality, flexibility, and verbal and nonverbal skills. Physically, their fine motor and gross motor skills are being practiced and developed. It's not just play. They are skills for life. So this ends uh, the lecture for this week. Please remember to write your student number in the subject line when you submit an assignment and on the actual assignment and write your answers on the document that, that was sent to you. Have a wonderful week of learning.